Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Am I on? Yes, I'm on. Uh, I'm Stefan Weitz. I'm from Microsoft. I do the Bing thing. And uh, you know, I, I know the last session was full of amazingly good content. Uh, the one thing that I took away that you can all tweet out very easily in 140 characters, uh, I think I got this right, uh, Google kills people with the elephant. I <laughs> thought I heard that. Uh, may have been transitory. That, is there a clicker, or am I just going to wave my hand? Is that how it's going to work? I mean, I can certainly do that, but thanks very much. There, great. OK. Yeah, we're going to go a little bit further uh, down the path than uh, maybe other speakers have gone today. Because I think it's important that folks like you who are thinking about how you can optimize your campaigns long term are thinking about what the long term looks like. So I'll give you one view. You may, you may say this is a biased view or a view only you at Microsoft have. But I think you'll see that uh, through some research we have and through some data, it's probably pretty accurate. So I want, first want to talk about what the web, how it's changed. Right, think about this. Back in the old days, say 12, 15 years ago, the web really was a topical web. And what that means is the protocols that were developed by Tim Lee, HTTP and HTML, they really generated a web of pages, a web of text. And things were developed like directories and keyword search that allowed us to navigate that web and navigate those links. And what, what, that, what that did is it actually created a web full of nouns, full of topics. So we know that there are uh, topics on the web that have a collection of pages. And that's because of the inherent structure of the web. Now it's changed a little bit in the last, say, five years or so. I mean, the first thing we really saw probably in, in mass was the social phenomena. The great social buzz phrase of, of, the, of the 2010s. Uh, everyone's talking social. Well, it is important for a couple of reasons. It's the first time in human history that the connections that were previously locked in our head or locked in a little black book in our desk are now available for systems to use to do things. In other words, my friends, my, my family, my, all my connections that previously, even five years ago, were all locked inside my head or locked in an Excel spreadsheet or locked in Outlook are now available for systems to use to do interesting things. And then, of course, the geospatial aspect. This is a weird one. I, hate, I actually hate the phrase geospatial, but I keep using it for some reason. But geospatial really means today we, we, we've evolved from maps, evolved from uh, car, you know, cartographic representations of the world. And we literally have modeled or recreated much of the physical world in digital form. So we understand that this place is a hotel. It's got 486 rooms. It's, uh, 700 and, or it's uh, 412 feet high. It has X, percent, X square feet of meeting space. We actually understand this at a very, very micro level about the entire planet. It has some interesting effects. And finally, we're seeing the web move towards, towards tasks. And if you don't believe me, just think about all the apps you have on your iPad or you know, your, your Windows tablet. Damn it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you just wait. All right, you just wait. It's going to be awesome. Um, but think of all the, think of all the, serious, it's going to be awesome. All right, so think of all the apps you have. And really, those apps are little tasks you perform, and, and you're using the web as the backbone to actually do something. So the web has moved down this path from a topical one where you had a bunch of nouns that you navigated through a search engine, all the way to this very, very complex web where you do a bunch of stuff. And really what you see here is this continuum of increasing complexity. And I want to use that word very specifically, very scientifically. It is a more complex web, meaning that things in the web are described in a very, very small level of detail. And that's very important for the next part of the talk. Unfortunately, search, which you would hope is at that far end of the spectrum, is really more kind of you know, back there. Oops, that's a fast switch. Basically, it's back there. It's back where it was in the top of the web. We actually search with nouns. Let's get a little further. The, the web, as we, as we know it, uh, it, is this kind of crazy ch uh, change from this text web to one of objects. So we think a lot about the web as a collection of related objects. So you have things like the real-time fire hose, all the stuff that actually people are putting out there all the time, with Twitter and Facebook and Foursquare and you name it, core, everything else. You got people, we talk about people, this explosion of people that we are able to actually uh, look at and understand now. We've got services, and this is the one that I am most excited about. Services are the, 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 the magic that a lot of our apps, a lot of our tasks use to facilitate the notion of I want to do something to getting it done. Now, 10 years ago, services you may use in the web are like eBay to maybe bid on something. Maybe you bought a book on Amazon. Maybe you actually booked a flight on Expedia. But you really didn't do a lot in, your, in the offline world online a decade ago. There weren't that many services out there. 
Well, today there are literally thousands and thousands of services that are out there. I mean, these are some smaller ones that I love. Well, OpenTable is not small, but True Knowledge, OpenTable, Taxi Magic, Booking Bug, all these things exist to do things in the real world, and they all offer APIs you can call into, and they all enable you to take a person from idea to action. Very interesting concept. Then, of course, you have things like multimedia, of course, all the crap out there on the web, and it's not all crap, there's great stuff too. Uh, but I didn't put YouTube, YouTube here for a reason, not because they're a competitor, uh, but because they actually have a pretty good uh, amount of information about each video. They, they do a good job structuring that. But things like YFrog, which is a you know, TwitPic type thing, all you have is a picture and maybe a geolook, maybe a location. So there's not a lot of information there. Finally, you have objects like places. We understand that the subway down the street is different than the subway in New York. Uh, and devices. And don't think of devices as just tablet versus phone. Literally, the, this one device over here, this, this crazy uh, rabbit, my daughter has this rabbit. It's called Violet. It's a French company, which tells you all you have to know. Uh, but it's, 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 a, it's a great little device that actually has no UI except for lights and ears. So she walks up to this, this rabbit in the morning and she actually says, she presses its head and she says in a little six year old voice, weather. That's higher though. And, and the rabbit hears this and actually queries a web service in the, in the cloud and brings back the weather and reads it out to her in a, in a natural voice with a French accent. Very strange. Uh, but, but, but it is, so, so it's very concerning. I hear in the morning, it will be, it's a photo today. And I'm like, what the hell is going on in my house? So uh, th there is, uh, there is this, this notion of devices. And it's not just about tablets. It's about all different ways of interacting with the web. So the web itself has changed tremendously. The problem is that search engines are kind of dumb. Let me explain this a little more, because I'll get fired for saying this, obviously. Uh, so let me explain what I mean by this. If you look at, here's an example. If you look at Bing, and you go to uh, type in Beast Hotels, uh, Beast New York Hotels. Now I meant you know, to type best, of course. But look what we do here. You know, we actually say, OK, are you looking for best New York hotels? Well, I, I am, but what I'm really looking for is this. Like, I want a hotel near Bryant Park, where the meeting is, that has reliable air conditioning, because it sucks in many cases, good smelling shampoo, because I like my hair to smell nice, uh, and a shower taller than me, because I hate getting you know, washed in my chest only. Uh, I want a decent bar, a coffee maker, I don't care if it's Starwood, it needs to be cheap. That's what I mean. That's what I mean to say. But I know if I put that phrase in my search engine, what's going to happen? I mean, <laughs> that, that phrase, we will simply, I think at that point, just tell you to go away. Like, we'll have no idea what to do with that. It's just, there's too many words, too complex. Another example, uh, a more directed example. Like this is a really good example. Watch the dark night. There's not a lot of ambiguity there. I mean, yeah, you could say maybe he wants the dark night watch, but, which by the way, there is one on Amazon if you want to buy it, if you're really, really into Christian Bale. Uh, but, but pretty much, that's, a, that's like a 98% confidence rating that that means like, they want to watch the movie. Now look at the first result. I get some Romanian pirate site. I'm, I mean, good for Romania, uh, but that's not probably the best result for that particular uh, uh, query. We do slightly better, uh, if you look at ours, but still not great. I mean, we still have the Romanian site there, because they do a great job with their SEO, clearly. <laughs> like, you go watch-movies.ro. Uh, <laughs> you got to fix that. Uh, but, but, but see, here at least we say, OK, the intent is watch. That's probably a movie object. And so at least here we're starting to say, OK, we know there's a verb we can associate with the object, and we give you some options to go watch it. And if you go to the actual page for The Dark Knight, we'll actually you know, pull up uh, this whole page. Now, I want to I spend some time on this page, not to promote Bing, but just to show you how, how I think all engines are going to start thinking. What we have here, when you click on The Dark Knight object, you've got a bunch of stuff. You've got a synopsis. That's easy. Uh, you've got trailers. So think back to the Web of Objects slide I had, and all the multimedia objects that were there. Well, that's what these are. These are getting pulled in. Now, these aren't all from the same website. They aren't all from a singular place. These are literally pulled across the web organically to associate these objects, in this case, multimedia videos, with this entity called the Dark Knight, this thing called the Dark Knight. We do things like user reviews, 162,000 of them, again, from across the web. We understand that people leave reviews, and the reviews are associated to, a, to an object, in this case, a movie. We do things like related, and we even do things like places. We can say, we know that uh, you can buy this DVD, actually, from buy.com, from Bonanza, and you can watch it in these places. So literally, what's happening with this, with this page is an example of how we are beginning in search to think of the web, and in this case, very particularly, a movie, as a physical object in reality that has characteristics 
around which you can take action. I'll, I'll, I'll explain that, that more uh, in a little bit. Because I'm sure at this point in the morning, you're like, he put so many words together in a weird grammatical uh, way. I just want to get more coffee. So here it is. This is where we think a lot of search actually is, is going. And it bears out pretty well with, with user research that we've done. People are not content with the current model of searching and finding. If you look at the general way we search, we do a search for, say, a restaurant, and maybe we get to the, in, in the old days, we were happy if we were able to get the phone number on the first page. Did a little dance, right? And we would actually pin, pick up the, we would go with an offline, pick up the phone, call the restaurant, and ask them for, if they have reservations for this evening. Funny story, apparently, I was talking to research folks yesterday, and they said, uh, people don't make reservations at restaurants, Stefan. And I go, but they don't? They said, no, they just, they just go. I'm like, well, then what are they? I, I, I'm so perplexed. And I said, well, are they younger? Are they older? They go, oh, they're younger. They're younger. So th there's no lines at TGI Fridays. I'm like, I, I'm just lost. Anyway, my point is, is that uh, that went nowhere. Even in my head, that was going nowhere. I was saying it. I don't know why I told you that story. But they're moving from search and find to searching and doing. About 58% of heavy searchers that we've talked to say they want the search engine to help them actually complete the task in the real world, not just point them at something. 58%. It's a huge number. About 35%, it drops down a little lower if you consider all searchers. But for the heavy searchers, those who we think about as more uh, on the vanguard of searching, almost 60% well, you know, of them or so say getting to the final action inside of search is very important for them. This has big implications for a lot of you and your companies. So here's what happens today, though. Because Linda, our friend Linda, looks so happy, she knows that today's search engines are going to bomb if she attempts to do anything more than a noun-based search. She actually just types in home gym. Because if she actually, I mean, maybe she, put, maybe she puts a verb in there like assemble. Maybe she does install. Maybe she does buy. But generally, we see most queries where two, two and a half words don't have a, don't have a verb or more noun-based. And therefore, we have to do a lot of magic to make sense of that. So here you see Linda querying for something like home gym. Now what's happening here, what we have to do now, because it's a very noun-based search, and because we've been beaten down as searchers over the past decade to believe search engines can't do more than that, we just type that in. The impetus is now on the engines themselves to figure out what the hell you mean. Because let me tell you, we get a lot of queries like squirrels. No idea what you mean by that. So we have to do some intent derivation, right? So we have to figure out, OK, uh, home gym, uh, you know, what do we do? We say, who is Linda? What's her past behaviors? You know, where is she physically? Obviously, geolog stuff. What have others like Linda done when they've searched for home gym? Where have they ultimately ended up? You know, semantic technology to look at what home gym actually is and how it fits into the overall equation. We do employ elves. It's a true story. Uh, they're over in Bellevue. They have a great location. But they do a lot of work, a little secret stuff to figure out what it is you mean. And now from there, we can then start deriving the actual task she wants to accomplish. So we can start to say, OK, we know Linda is a woman. She's 27. She lives in Seattle. Uh, and she's been, been doing a lot of queries recently on, on, on marriage. So we can begin to start, we can start to assume that home gym for Linda might be about purchasing or installing, because she maybe wants to get in shape for her wedding, as an example. So we begin to start deriving tasks. I'm pointing at this like it's going to help you. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I start to do tasks. So purchase, install, sell, set fire to, impress friends, a lot of things that you could do with that little query home gym. And after we understand the task, we can then take the, the, the bigger step of creating an experience that helps her do something, not just find something. So we assemble all this crazy content. We assemble all these cool services I've talked about. We assemble videos on how to, in this case, assemble uh, a home gym. We get real-time data from people who are talking about how much they hate their home gym assembly process. It's like IKEA from hell. Uh, my wife bought one of these Vectras, and I thought, I could assemble this. So I get it in there. It's like four trillion pounds. And I get it in there, and it's still not assembled. That was like two weeks ago. Uh, so they, don't buy them. They're horrible. Uh, but basically, you have this. Uh, the veteran's great, but the home gym is generally horrible. And if this, this user experience wrapped around all these things that let me go from idea to doing. Here's the problem. And it's a big problem. We don't really know what a home gym is, like physically. You probably do, but think about how you learned that. And to think about that, I, I think about this picture. 
So I was on a site looking around for this presentation, trying to figure out how to explain this problem, and I came across this photo that someone posted. And they said, does anybody know what this is? I looked at it. Well, how would you discern that as a human? You'd pick it up, you'd look at it, you'd smell it, you'd feel it, you'd kind of un see what color it was, how heavy it was. You would look at the head and try to figure out what that head actually did. You might rub it across something. And eventually, through your exploration, you would attribute a number of attributes, a number of characteristics about this object in your head. So now you know, or you think you know, this object is something that, through all your exploration, uh, Julian's carrots. It helps you make really thin carrot slices. So what happens then is you as a human are able to start taking questions about julienning carrots. When my wife now says, hey, honey, would you julienne carrots? Uh, I say, okay, well, I, first I have to interpret the query that she's given me. Julian carrots. Okay, Julian is not the guy. It's, it's actually an activity. It's cutting thinly. Carrots are an object in the fridge. Okay, I have these objects. I, there's an object that I'm aware of that I can associate with that request, i.e. Julian and carrots, that can help me accomplish the task, i.e. pick up this thing and actually slice carrots. So I associate objects like this with actions in my head. And so do you. If you are asked to put lotion on a home gym, you would pause. If you were asked, well, maybe you wouldn't, I would. Uh, if, 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 you were, if you were asked to dive into a home gym, you would pause. Because implicitly, you know, a home gym is not something onto which you rub lotion. Why that example keeps coming up, I am not sure. Uh, but you know implicitly you wouldn't do that. Now, there's a whole different lecture I could give you on, on a, a funny problem with this particular picture. This picture is actually something I learned later to de-shed dogs. Uh, and so now, if you attempt to julienne carrots with it, not only will the, you will not get julienne carrots, you will get disgusting dog dander all over your salad. Uh, but, but it's actually an interesting problem because uh, in the computer science, the fact that I, I was told or I assumed it was indeed a kitchen utensil gives me what's called a confirmation bias loop, and therefore all my further assumptions related to this object could be mistaken as well. Bottom line, it's a big comp sci talk, but it gets really messy really fast. But let's just say, let's just say for now that we were accurate. As humans, we now understand this is something with which we uh, turn long carrots into short, small, skinny carrots. But we did that through all of our research on our own. Talked to people, looked around, got it. Understand that. Imagine the problem for a computer, for a system. Here is Milton's famous red stapler. Now a computer has to go figure out what the hell this thing is. Where does it even start? Well, let's think about it from a human standpoint. I'm going to go and find some canonical place that has information about red stapler. So I go to ThinkGeek, of course. So I go to ThinkGeek as a computer, and I begin to look across Think, ThinkGeek's page. And I see all this data. I see all these words, all these things on ThinkGeek's page. Now, what, system, what we do now, what systems do now is attempt to figure out which of those words are, are relevant to describe the object. So here I'm actually seeing, OK, swing line's a brand. Metal's interesting. It's got large capacity. It's got a certain size and weight. Lumberg likes it. So I start to actually create, I start to, just like a kid or like, like you did for a new object you don't understand, you begin to explore and try to figure out the characteristics for this object. So when somebody asks if they can drink a red stapler, we say, hmm, I don't think metal's good to drink. The problem, unlike us humans, is that this data doesn't exist just on ThinkGeek's page. It exists on 20,000 pages, none of which have the same structure, none of which use the same vocabulary. One might say 20-sheet capacity, one might say 20-sheet stapling opportunity. One might say metal, one might say steel. Uh, so literally we have, unlike us, that have a limited set of options that we go to, to to describe the world. Computers, unfortunately, and fortunately for us, have millions of places they can go to understand how to describe that stapler. It's a big problem. But you might be saying, Stefan, you're making this more hard than it needs to be. There are clearly places out there that already have done a great job assembling all this data. Things like IMDB for movies. The canonical source for entertainment information, IMDb. Just go there, index that, use it as your start point, you'll be fine. Well, sort of. And the problem, even though IMDb actually is an excellent, excellent source, you can see that there are about, about like a 19% duplication of titles. That isn't bad data necessarily. It could just be that movies actually have the same title, which in fact they do. There are actually 12 avatars if you look at IMDb, not just one. So even this different, different movies are the same title, which is a big problem. Even the same title, and year 
So look at this, 2008. For some reason, we thought it was a good idea to make three versions of Journey to the Center of the Earth. One with Brendan Fraser, Seattle native, uh, and then a couple of other ones. We don't know who these, are, who these are. So literally, even if you start narrowing it down, you get this, you get this problem. Worse, even movies, a single movie, goes by a bunch of different names. Things like an exclamation point change, or uh, you know, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, turns into A Nightmare on Elm Street 6, Freddy's Dead. So you have all this problem of the same movie being aliased across a number of different sites. Problem, problem is even the best well-structured data you think in your head still has issues. So what do we do? Well, we tend to curl up in the corner and, and, and uh, rock back and forth. But once we get past that, we start using a thing called graph algorithms. So graph algorithms are a computer science model that, that help us kind of traverse trees to make it really dorky. So basically, let's just take an example of how I can understand what the hell Barbie Veritopia Mermadia is as an object. Like the Dark Knight, I built that object model. I want to build that object model now for Barbie Veritopia. So I go to IMDb, canonical source, great source. Bunch of information, super, got it, love it, all this stuff. Uh, but now I want to actually enable a user to watch Barbie Veritopia. So I want to go ahead and, and link over to Netflix and find the same object in Netflix so I can allow people to watch that very easily. Well, there's a problem. If I go to Netflix, there actually isn't a title match. So this title exists nowhere in Netflix. Oh, crap. All right, so then I, I so I, I, I start to do some graphing. And I start to say, oh, well, you know, this guy here is 75 minutes, is close to that 75 minutes. And so what happens, because this metadata has no match, this metadata has one match, the time in this case, the machine learning algorithm is going to bias to say, this probably is the match for this object. So we begin to create this object. I can now watch Barbie Ferritopia Media on Netflix under this alias. Except you can't do that. You're wrong. When you do graphing, we're able to kind of keep recursing what's called recursing through the set. What that means is we can look down and say, actually, interestingly enough, this one has the same date match and actually has the same uh, title match. So this now is the actual the same thing. This guy is related to this guy, which we thought initially was our close second match. But because we've now ruled out these two are the same, we now have to assume that this actually is Barbara Ferry Topa Mermadia. Now, as you can see, it's a kind of a complicated process. Now, imagine I just did this for two sources, IMDb and Netflix. Imagine doing that across 30 sources for movies. You can see the complexity of, of, this, of this particular problem. So what the hell are we going to do? Well, there's one option that we have. And it's this thing called schema.org. Many of you may have heard of it. Many of you may be cursing me right now as I'm talking about this. There's been a lot of consternation and, and uh, angst about this since we announced it about a month and a half ago. But it's a collaboration between Google, uh, myself, or Bing, and, and, and Yahoo to create some kind of descriptor language that you all can use across your websites to help us understand the things that are on your page. So literally now, if you offer Barbie Peritopia Media, you can now actually start to model that out. You can actually tell us that it's a movie. Here's the cast. This is the release date. All those sorts of things. You can literally embed all this structured data that we can consume, as can Google, as can Yahoo, to create really interesting experiences because we now understand the objects. So SEMA.org is this new thing that's out there. Go to the site. You can check it out. Uh, and it literally is about 100 or so different, ob or different classes of objects that we've modeled out. Uh, to enable a, a kickstart to the, to the system so you guys can start taking advantage of this. But that, isn't, that doesn't mean it's, it's, it's definitive. We understand that uh, there's actually a lot of extending that has to happen in order for us to be able to describe the entire planet in digital. In fact, here is an example of, of a product. So product has a bunch of attributes. Uh, there are things like manufacturer, model, ID, reviews, brand, all sorts of things here that are properties of that product. But there isn't things like weight, height, length, and model, or weight, height, and length. So what we do is that we actually allow us to extend that schema. This is getting very geeky. The few of you who have to do this for a living will, will appreciate this. But literally, you can just simply think of it as adding attributes to the schema. So we can add a row here called product weight, add a row here called uh, length, one called height. So what it allows you to do as a, very, as a niche guy or gal in, in a space, it allows you to create a schema or a, a way of describing your services, even if they aren't already in schema.org. Now, there's a caveat. There's no guarantee that the engines themselves will use your extensions. 
So if, if you say are a carpet manufacturer and you go crazy and create the most elaborate schema for carpets known to man, there's no guarantee that Bing or Google or Yahoo will actually use that schema. What, what will happen though is if you have a good schema, other folks will adopt it with you. As we see a critical mass forming, we then begin to uh, consume those things. So just because you create your own extension, don't think it's gonna help you right away. The idea is you can create one that actually allows you to get ahead of the game uh, down the road. So that's, that helps us really model out this red stapler. And it's actually very useful today. So before we get to the whole crazy, you can do tasks in the web because we now understand objects and their properties, we're actually using uh, something like this today. We have things like uh, badges, we call them in Bing, right? So we actually have, uh, we're pulling out structured data from Yelp, so we see the number of reviews and the average rating. Urban Spoon's the same way. Uh, Google actually has done a nice job with using uh, a microformat called HRecipe, which allows them to uh, create a very interesting uh, recipe search. Now I wanna show you something here. If I could just switch to the machine really quickly, this is kinda cool. So, uh, let me show you an example of, of how structured, really? Oh man, okay. Yes, I'm making my default browser. Of course I do. I'm right here. <laughs> Duh. I'm sure all yours is that default too. All right, so let's go to Google. Oops, if I could type, I can't even type. It's a, it's a hard word to type, isn't it? It's such a ter ter terrible, terrible word to type. Uh, uh -oh. I was told there'd be no math. Yeah, well good. So, you know, here's the thing. Uh, what's, what's amazing about this, uh, is the beautiful white page that you see. But what's amazing, if I can show you in real life, is, this, is, is, is how structured data is used today inside of Google. Uh, here, what they do is they literally have chicken cacciatore, and on the left-hand side here you can see all these refinements, their ingredients, tomatoes, capers, anchovies, penne, et cetera. So you can literally say, only show me things with those ingredients. And you have time and calories. These all come directly from the structured data that these sites have embedded on their websites. So it's no longer a mess of words like tomato and basil. They actually have, they now have a, have a little micro format that says ingredient equals tomato, amount equals two tablespoons. And that allows, us, that allows Google to do this. We actually have a recipe search too. We actually had it before they did, like almost a year before they did. Not competitive at all, just letting you know. Uh, that, so, uh, but we didn't actually use structured data. We actually use machine learning. Uh, and when you, see, when you compare the difference, you'll see what, you'll see what the difference is because uh, Google is more accurate in the sense that if I check rosemary, I will only get things that have rosemary as a, as a, as a micro format attribute in the recipe. But Bing is more flexible because we've used natural language. We can let you th see things like is it kid friendly, is it good for brunch, that kind of thing. So, the, so not, not to say that micro formats will solve all of our problems. There's going to be a blend of micro formats for very good structured data and natural language like, like we've done in recipes. Merging those together, you'll get some very powerful experiences. So it's already useful today. So you can even start doing this today, even if uh, uh, we aren't taking full advantage of it. Okay, so uh, there are some conspiracy theories about this. I've heard a lot of them. I've read a lot of them. I've talked to folks who tell me that they know we're trying to take over the web. They know that Google, Microsoft, and Yahoo are going to come and, and make you all use a certain schema because some, then somehow we're going to do something else to you. Not quite sure what exactly, but uh, here's what I've heard. Uh, one of them was that I just wanted to become an entity, which is kind of true. I made myself an entity in the schema which is pretty awesome. I didn't really, don't worry. Uh, the other one was that uh, we all needed a reason to charge in our bar bills. We were sitting around one night in a bar, true story, uh, thought of this and then thought we have to have a business reason for this meeting. Uh, there is schema.org, that might be something that happened. Uh, or we just were told that we needed a uh, fourth horseman to fully bring the apocalypse in and we thought we could do that. Uh, well, honestly, the, really the biggest reason is we like, we like to see geeks in fights, uh, like myself. So we all like slap fights, they're funny, we enjoy them. Uh, so those are the, the top three reasons. There's none, none of these. This really is a, the reason, I hope you could take this away, the reason structured data is so important is it allows systems to understand the world as it is and allows systems to understand what things people, us, us searchers, can do in that world with those things. If I understand this is a clicker, and I, the systems can now know I actually pick it up and click through with slides to, to make use of this. That's a very important thing to know if we're gonna help people actually get from idea, I wanna click through slides, to action, I'm actually clicking through slides. So, here's the you go do's. Oh, I, so I can't use bullets, so never mind. Uh, uh, so the first you go do uh, is, we have a workshop in the valley if you're down there, 21st. If you go to uh, workshop at schema.org, mail us, we'll give you information, or go to the schema.org blog and you can see it. 
Uh, but there's a workshop there to hear uh, issues, complaints, concerns, problems, and also just teach folks how they can make use of this thing right now. That's one option you can do. Uh, we also think about, if you're in a very specific domain, think about domain-specific extensions. In other words, if you are selling uh, uh, wakeboards, or if you're selling uh, self-tanning products, or you're selling replacement contact lenses for people who don't need them, whatever, uh, th th think about uh, some things that you could do in that domain. So the American Association of Educational Publishers have actually extended schema.org already to include educational stuff. So books and articles and that types of things. So think about what, what, is your area big enough? Are there enough players in your, in your space where you could collaborate and create a, a, a domain extension for your area? And the last thing you can, do, you can go do is think about your roadmap and your, and your, for your CMSs. Um, I wouldn't, if you have already have a backlog of a year of stuff you have to do with your CMS to publish content or a bunch of stuff happening right now, I, this, this isn't something I would necessarily uproot and do right now. Like, I wouldn't say, oh, we're shelving all the next year backlog and doing schema right now. But it is something you need to get in your roadmap. It's something you should be thinking about, slotting it in there six months from now, eight months from now, be thinking about how you can implement structured data across your sites. Now, there aren't a lot of plugins today for CMSs. WordPress doesn't have one. These guys don't have one. We're talking to all of them, of course, but um, those are, it's not there today, so there's a bit of a disconnect, but it is something to think about, how could I do that? So, the reason why, again, you're still like, I'm not sure I've really convinced you why this is so important. Well, think back to poor Linda, right? And she, all she wanted to do is get fit for her wedding. Uh, and she issued that little query, home gym, that we have to figure out what she means, what she wants to do with it, and ultimately tie everything together in an experience which actually helps her do it. But before we can do any of that, we have to understand this. We have to understand what the hell a home gym is before we can do anything else. Once we understand what it is, we can begin to, 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 take, to, to ascribe actions to it. So then once we understand that something is a concert, we know people want to buy things. Once we understand that something is a person, we, we understand they want to share things. Once we understand that something is a taxi, we, want, we understand we want to do things with it, right? And so what we're doing, and this is like a baby step towards the longer vision, this year's about figuring out how to, how to model everything on the planet, how to make sure we understand what the hell this thing is, all the attributes about it, what is, every characteristic about it. Because once we have that, we're able to start ascribing actions that link over to sites, and these sites and services could be yours. If you guys are a, a, a niche service that, that connects uh, boiler manufacturers uh, to, uh, to natural gas suppliers, uh, maybe you can offer a service that makes that connection easier. And now when people are searching for, for that particular task, we can actually connect that seamlessly through the experience. But before any of this magic can happen, before we can help Linda get to her home gym, we have to make sure we think about a little red stapler and think about how we can model that thing effectively in silicon so we can apply actions to it when people ask about it. I think that's it. Yeah. Thanks a lot.